Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hello. Hello. Hey, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Max Presnell, um, and I'll be hosting this session for this evening. Uh, Sean Noyce, who is actually billed there as Ronnie Feldman, um, so it's in incognito. Act as a uh, We'll be taking care of the technology tonight. Uh, hopefully, nothing is going to go wrong. Um, so, yeah. Woohoo! <laughs> um, and hello to everyone that I already know, because it's good to see some of you. I haven't seen some of you in a, in a, in a bit. Um, so Personal Contacts is a, is a series of exhibitions by Durden and Ray, uh, which are going to feature four members who have selected four other artists, one each, um, to join them in the exhibition. Now, um, what's going to happen with that, and is, is currently happening, is we'll have an exhibition in the gallery, which you can visit, um, wearing masks, only two people allowed in at any one time. Um, or you can go online to our website, um, which uh, Sean can stick up on the chat, I guess, um, if anybody wants to go online and see the excellent and awesome job of the 3D technology that Brian did for us um, to walk around the space. It's, it's like Google, but in the gallery. So that's really fantastic. Um, so you can do that. Um, the I, so for us, um, we were thinking of ways that uh, we could use the uh, gallery in a way that was more um, uh, looking outwards um, and sort of more community-based. Um, but we wanted to make sure that we could do it within a, a context of connection. And so uh, this series, um, we randomly uh, divided the group into fours. Um, and those four people then invited one each uh, artist to come and join us. In the actual exhibition uh, space, there is an artwork by the person who did the inviting as well, um, because there is a connection between each artist's works, um, according to the person who selected them, of course, um, which I think if you go online, if you can't visit the gallery, is a really, really interesting experience to kind of really try and understand what the connection between the two artists uh, might be and can be, um, because it really is a interesting way to curate a show together with this, these uh, links that are not obvious and direct. Um, it's an it's a interesting thing. Anyway, um, we'll be doing this every two weeks. Um, so you, you'll be able to join these meetings every couple of weeks. Um, you can go to the gallery, like I said, um, on Saturdays, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., just on the Saturdays. Um, again, wear the masks. Um, these in, the rest of the time, it will be through the online and through these, um, these uh, interviews. Okay, is there going to be any questions? We're good so far. Okay. So um, the, the groups, group, uh, uh, Marcus Esatelli with, is with Brian Thomas Jones, Shiva Ali Abadi with Gul Kagan. I always say Gul Kagan, but I know that's not how you say it in Turkish. Um, Chair's guest is with me, and Kimberly Morris is with Sean Noyce. Okay, so. Uh, we'll move straight into the uh, interview session, I guess, um, and go to uh, Brian. Hey, Mark, how's it going? Good, man. How are you doing? Doing well. Um, to start out, I just, you know, ask you to give a little bit of uh, your background and, you know, arts education, how you kind of got uh, to be a painter. Okay. Um, I've been painting for about a little over 20 years, and I've always been artistic, but um, I started off as a musician and uh, how I found painting was I was taking a break from uh, music and needed to get away from it and got a paint set and started painting. <laughs> and uh, I put away the guitars and just kept on it for 20 years. Um, it's something that, um, it was an evolution for me as an artist and uh, something that I, I continue to this day, every day doing it. And uh, that's, that's basically how I became an, a painter. I've always been an artist in some way, some form. But uh, that's how I, I, I found painting was by basically taking a summer break and buying a paint set. Wow. So yeah. you're self-taught? Did you have any uh, formal education in painting? No, no formal education. Uh, just basically just showing up every day, uh, painting, uh, learning from the masters, reading books, reading biographies and uh, asking questions about painters I admire and, and getting some tutelage and some mentorship along the way. But basically just showing up fakes and 
trying to create something that I felt was uh, what I was feeling. Uh, that's great that uh, you managed to bypass the student debt loan. I already got student debt from another career. <laughs> I'm still paying, uh, but I'm, it's not for painting. Uh, yeah, so uh, I couldn't actually afford to go to school, so I just uh, had to do it my own. Well, that's yeah. great. I think that's unusual for our artists in this town, uh, at least yeah. collectives. So um, when I asked you to be in this show, uh, is because you know we met in your studio one night here at Open Studios and just kind of hit it off. And yeah. um, can you tell me to talk a little bit about uh, what you feel is the connection and the contact between our work, our two paintings? Uh, yeah, the first time I met you, we had a pretty lengthy conversation, and um, it really resonated with me. And uh, we, I think, we spoke for a couple hours when we first met each other, and you came to the studio and we. We had a great chat, and uh, when you showed me the two pieces that you were putting in the show, um, I felt an immediate uh, kinship to them. I was uh, I was struck by them, and I really like the peacefulness of it. And um, I, I brought this painting in, uh, thinking that it would be a good uh, position between our two works. Um, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, what what with uh, what kind of statement are you making with your work? Because I noticed that this painting and several others that I really liked, and it was a tough call of which one to choose for the show. Uh, what do you feel like this this represents to you and, and to our current times? Um, it's pretty much like a triumph or disaster for me. Um, I painted this last summer actually, and um, it was. Go ahead, camera off, so you can just look over here. Okay. Uh, it was something that's on mute right now. <laughs> I've never. This is my first okay, Zoom. Turn back on. So it's it's kind of uh, interesting to to talk this way on to a computer, but um, it's just basically a documentation of my life, um, triumph and disaster, with this piece here. Um, it lends relativity to what's happening in the world so right now. Uh, and, I, and I felt that it was, it, it was a, a good image yeah, for I, I what in the, the human yeah, so is going Somebody needs to mute. Yeah. Yes. So um, how do you see this contrasting with the piece that I have? Sean, can you get that up there? Sure. There you go. Yeah, we have two different dichotomies of uh, yours is really, for me, is really peaceful and tranquil. And mine is a bit of, um, you know, triumph or disaster for me. And I like the way they, they play off of each other. And you can find calmness in one piece and um, something dramatic in the other. And uh, I, I think they balance each other out. It's almost like a yin and a yang. Yeah, that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah. So, uh, I think that that, you know, I really like having your uh, description of that. Thank so you. I want to move on to um, your uh, experience in Los Angeles showing your art and being in exhibitions uh, versus uh, your out of state and out of California. Uh, experiences. Uh, you're rep by a gal by two galleries, right, in other states. Yeah, and uh, that's sort of unusual in Los Angeles because here everybody is really trying to, you know, chase the golden hoop of, of gallery representation with, you know, uh, uh, commercial galleries, which is why you know I think that uh, Gurdon Ray is successful in existing just for the artists. Right. Yeah. So. Um having uh, another gallery in another city is is great but it's challenging because you don't get to see them you don't get to connect with them as much as you'd like you're you're long distance you're emailing you're it's 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 kind of convoluted in a way my experience um i like it but i i and uh, having a gallery locally is a much stronger sometimes a uh, bond because you get to see them it's more personal um you, you get more of a connection you know and uh 
yeah, the, the long distance thing is kind of tough with everything. But does it allow you to have a certain perspective then, maybe a distant perspective on uh, the way the LA art market is with the competition and the uh, craziness of it all? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You, we're kind of in the, the Mecca, you know, we're in the, this is the big leagues. So we can, um, there's a lot to learn from this, this town, you know? And your bar has to be really, is raised really high if you want to show here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, the epic, it's the epicenter almost right now. So, and what has been your experience uh, showing in LA? It's been great. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've uh, been in. enjoyed it. <laughs> uh, I've been showing for 20 years and, uh, made some good connections and, uh, you know, had some good dealers and been able to uh, sustain myself from it, which is good. That's from uh, the commercial aspect of your work. Yeah. Uh, what about uh, exhibiting for the art for the sake of art, so to speak, with like this show that you're in and other this shows is, about collectives or- This is such uh, an honor to show with you guys. Um, these, the painting that I showed, I'm showing now it's it it's one of my favorite pieces um it's it's one of my uh i think purest pieces um that uh a lot of dealers were just like man that's just we can't sell that you know that's not going to sell why are you doing that paint over it they look at that i'm like no i'm not this is an important piece to me and i knew he was going to find some people to to appreciate it and see it i just didn't know who or when, but I knew I had to keep on, keep it and not paint over it. Cause it, for me, it was a very special piece and it resonates with me, especially right now with what's really going on in the world. You know? uh, when you, you just mentioned painting over a piece, do you do that often? You, you Sometimes, piece yeah, then... yeah. I'll, uh, I'll stick with the piece for a while and if it doesn't resonate with me anymore and I feel that I can do better um, I'll sacrifice the good for something better and I'll lose my attachment to the end result and not be too careful and just go for it. And usually when I let go and I just go for it, uh, something pure comes out of that transaction. And it's, it's more than overthink. It's better than overthinking it. And uh, you just kind of throw caution to the wind and, and uh, not be attached to the end result. And when you do that, that's pretty freeing. So this is an example of what I did. Um, this was, this took me about three weeks and um, I felt really strong with it and, and good with it. And uh, uh, I don't want to- Go ahead. And I didn't want to touch it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, this palette is similar to uh, the other paintings in this group, but you also have some some work that's very ghost-like. It uses much more of uh, monochromatic in the blues and the, the whites yeah. here. Sorry, we don't have an example of that, but uh, how do, so, uh, philosophically, how do the two different bodies relate? Well, well this one has um, splashes of primary red and blue. Um, most of my other work is pretty just monochromatic, which, is, which comes from my love of black and white photography and um, saying more with less. I give myself a couple tubes of paint and that's what I have. And I try to express the, the emotion with, the, with limiting that uh, palette. And I think I can say more with less. Um, if I have too many colors, it kind of gets uh, convoluted for me and, and it says too much and, and not enough of one thing, if that makes sense. Yes, sure. Yeah, I just, I just like palette and um and i find more emotion in that for me as an artist so uh sean how are we doing on time uh we have uh you have four minutes ah okay well with that in mind uh can you just talk about art in general anything that we haven't covered here that you'd like to express to the to the world you know, out here? is it really dry um uh. I basically, I, I think this show is really important uh, to connect with people. I think what you guys are doing is, is 
great concept. And uh, I hope, hope you guys continue with this because um, I think a lot of people are hungry for art and to, to have that connection. And uh, doing this is, I think, a really great way of, 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 of connecting, of bonding again, even if it's through a little screen. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm honored to be in this show and thank you for inviting me. I hey, really Brian? appreciate it. Yes, sir. Brian, there's a couple of questions um, in, the, uh, in the chat room. Um, oh. One, who do you show with? And the other one, uh, does your musical background play a role in the visual rhythm or process of your paintings? Yes, absolutely. Uh, music, I listen to music when I paint and uh, I, my wife says my paintings look like my music would sound. Um, the, the, the playing music and in, in art is, inner, it's, blends together basically. It's just another medium of expression. Um, one lens for me. And uh, I find I get the same emotion when I play guitar as I paint. So it all comes from the same source. It's just how you um, put it out there. Mm -hmm. And um, I show with a gallery uh, called Art Space on Beverly and uh, that's, that's pretty much my main gallery right now. And then I show with uh, Casterline Goodman in um, Aspen, Colorado. So. And one of my other galleries in Palm Springs closed down because of the COVID. Uh oh, that's too bad. Yeah. That's the way it's going these days. And yeah. just all these things are good. So uh, just one last thing. Uh, you've told me before, and there's a couple of comments here uh, about your work looks sort of Turner-esque. Yeah. Was that one of the big influences on you? Yeah, yeah, I really enjoy his work. I had a good conversation in his, in his work on this painting. And uh, uh, yeah, I, uh, he's an influence on me, you know? I definitely can see it. He <laughs> came through on this piece, yeah. All right, well, I think that's all I have. And I'd like to thank you for being in the show and thank you for taking part in this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, so um, thank you, Mark. Then we'll move on to uh, Gu. Uh, yes, um, I, I am with uh, Shivali Abadi. Um, uh, the way that I chose her uh, is, I, I remember seeing her once in, at, at Torrance Museum, she was um, doing some, I think, work, uh, you know, in space. And also I saw her at Post uh, Gallery. And, you know, she is um, a kind of artist that I think something resonated with me in her activities. One of the things was that she was, um, um, you know, trying to talk about her experiences uh, without, you know, kind of being pigeonholed to certain restricted visual, you know, uh, like cultural language, you know, it just, you're coming from this background, you do this, this, this kind of things. Instead of doing that, she was uh, trying to form a different, you know, language, in my opinion. And then that, that, resonated with me I'm, I'm trying to do that as well so um, uh, I'm just gonna let her uh, talk about herself and then um, uh, and then we, we I'll go to questions that I have uh, for her work okay thank you Gul. Um, so I'm Shiva Aliabadi and the works that are in this show are recent 2d works Normally I do installation and some kind of um, post studio, I guess, practice, if you want to call it that, with a lot of ephemeral materials, but this is the first time in a long time I've decided to do kind of more permanent um, pieces. Um, and I do a lot of oil uh, stick and oil pastel on uh, either canvas or um, 
or this kind of acid free paper to make it more of like something permanent, which is usually not what I do. I do usually do ephemeral work. Um, and um, I actually, just a quick background, I went to school at both Claremont and Otis. And so I know people from both those communities. And um, I stayed in LA for a bit after school. Uh, and I've kind of been going back and forth from the East Coast to, uh, to LA. And uh, it's been very fascinating getting a, a taste of all these different cultures, the different cities. Um, and um, uh, I'll say more as you ask me questions, but I'm really um, happy that you included me in this, in this exhibit because these uh, drawings, they, they're saying a lot. They're coming from a place that I haven't spoken from directly before. So um, it'd be nice to talk about where they come from. Um, uh, before, you know, uh, Zoom meeting started, we had some uh, conversation, uh, personal conversation with Shiva. I was kind of thinking, um, because she, she uh, told me that, you know, she had, a, you know, uh, certain memories, um, cultural memories, as well as living in anxiety, that sort of things. And I was thinking, um, these must be then, you know, related to, you know, personal psychological insight as well as some location. So I was thinking maybe these are like um, psychogeographic maps in my mind, mental maps. But, but she said, you know, um, I, I didn't take them as, as maps, but you know, we can talk about it. Um, the reason I was saying is that she was talking about her memory, uh, reverting, go, going back to that memories, you know, talking about uh, losing friendships, being uprooted from certain areas, coming back. And then all these things just kind of, I, I don't know, clicked in my head as, you know, little narratives in her mind and then related to certain time, uh, time in her life so you know some it has like some autobiographic information but yet at the same time these are all these information transpose into a certain abstract shapes, forms, or gestures in her work. So I'm still debating on that. Uh, and then I'm just very curious what she has to tell me about um, how she was thinking about uh, uh, making her work. Uh, go ahead, sure. Shiva. I mean, to use her word, I think it, uh, it's definitely a map of severe anxiety uh, that really, um, uh, caused these works, these recent works on paper to happen. Um, ironically, people have told me, oh, the work looks so soothing and, and uh, hopeful, and they're actually coming from the opposite uh, place. And um, they're tied to the fact that uh, from what you've already said about uh, me and what are uh, being uprooted so much, not just from Iran uh, at a young age, but also in the US uh, for various reasons, having moved around so much and being forced to in some situations, um, there's never been a, a stable place for me to anchor to and hang on to. And um, while some of my installations and 3D work uh, talk about it a little bit more directly with about objects and traces and things that you can't hold on to, um, these works actually come from the feeling of anxiety that's elicited from that experience. And the fact that um, I have trouble being rooted and anchored. And so sitting in a studio working for several hours to me is one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my life. And um, I actually haven't met people who had that experience yet. <laughs> I would love to meet them if they know what that feels like to be anchored in a place for a while and to um, create works such as this. Um, and, um, it, you know, the entire time that these drawings were created, I was definitely in a very um, anxious state because it was requiring me to um, be rooted, which is something that I'm very uncomfortable with. And it's an experience that I don't really know what that is. Um, I, I know that, um, you know, you talked about, you know, all these memories, you know, friends or you paying attention little things in your life because you don't probably have the 
bigger things that anchor to your life right now. Uh, tell me about more those mm -hmm. things, why yeah. it's happening. Mm -hmm. I think one of the ones that I've been talking about more recently um, has been, you know, when I left Iran in 83, um, my grandmother, that was actually one of my primary caretakers, uh, I didn't see her again, and I knew that I wouldn't see her again. I remember the day I left, and that really imprinted on me, what that means to lose people that are special to you, to know that you no longer have access to them. And I noticed that throughout my life that was happening in one way or another, where it was very difficult to hold on to people, to places, to zip codes even. Um, it was hard to place meaning on things because suddenly the meanings would shift. Uh, so even objects for me, I would try to make them special, like, oh, this was from you know, Christmas at so-and-so's house and it's very special. And, and yet that, uh, that object suddenly changes in meaning once that Christmas is over. So everything was always in flux. Everything was always in change. Um, and it was, there was a lot of loss. And when you lose, there's this strange vacuum that's created and this um, strange area of isolation and you don't know what to fill it with. Um, and so uh, in my life, it was filled with, um, you know, anxiety, as I mentioned before, and these um, almost acute but sad, I don't know what the word would be <laughs> if you put them together, attempts to make something, you know, a linear life that makes sense. And this is where I am. This is where I belong. Uh, and instead, it was just a constant displacement. Um, also, a lot of, you know, coming to the U.S. was uh, very jarring because we weren't accepted here. I, I came shortly after the uh, hostage crisis, so it was a, a very, you know, 20 drawings a day just to have something try to speak. Uh, and it's very difficult because I'm not 100% consciously sure of what's trying to to talk except for the feeling of anxiety, but um, something comes out on paper and that's, that's what is trying to speak. So sometimes when I look at my work, I'm, I'm a little baffled afterwards because I'm also looking at it as a viewer from the outside, <laughs> kind of like, oh, what did I just talk about? What did I just say from that place? So uh, in terms of chance uh, versus intentions, how much or which one is, uh, you know, you start with then? That would be my follow-up question in regard to how you explain your process. Yeah, you know, this series uh, that's in the show, uh, I definitely let chance kind of take over more. Um, you know, I've been told in grad school not to use the word intuition so many times, but it really came from an intuitive place. And, um, uh, whereas work before was very conceptual, the idea was there and I tried to follow through with the idea. With these, I was like, just let go and have uh, ch a chance um, do the job, which was terrifying and because I thought that, because I wasn't sure what was gonna result. You know, with these drawings, I don't know what's gonna happen when I draw them. Um, I did a book recently of drawings uh, when I was at a residency in Banff. Um, uh, we were there recently before COVID hit, and um, I did a hundred drawings in this in this book, and each page was just letting it happen as it wanted to, and it was grueling and freeing at the same time. Uh, and some, it, just a book of really interesting. I almost want to call it literature, <laughs> resulted, but it's in a language that is so abstract that when I look at it, I'm also wondering where it came from and you know because it was so intuitive in my um intellectual brain and, and my brain that wants to pick things apart and analyze was shut off a little bit more than normally uh, i guess um i'll move on to talking to my guest who is chaz chaz guest um guest of the guest okay so chaz was born in Ni uh, niagara falls in 1961 but raised in philadelphia he earned a Bachelor of Science in Graphic Design from the Southern Connecticut State University and then attended the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York. And then he moved to Paris, uh, where he wor worked for a Couture magazine. His work is in many private collections, uh, uh, notably President Obama's and Beth De Woody's collection, as well as a number of art collecting celebrities' collections, such as Angelina Jolie and Oprah Winfrey. Um, Chas created uh, The Buffalo Warrior, a comic book styled superhero, 
which he has continued to use in his paintings as an exploration of power, duty, responsibility, justice, masculinity, etc. And he's currently making a, a, a fully animated movie with the character. Um, my, selection, my selection was based on the fact that uh, both Chaz and I share an, uh, uh, a certain idea about how comic books uh, are a way of generating ideas of moral and ethical thinking, particularly for boys, mas a masculine outlet for that, and how that can tie in with ideas of martial arts, uh, motorcycle clubs, and various other subcultural um, groupings, which uh, uh, can force a kind of ethical rethinking and uh, that can relate back um, into uh, culture in some ways, hence my interest in his work. But um, So let me, let me move uh, straight into the questions, uh, Chaz. Um, so the work in this exhibition is from the Cotton series. Uh, tell us about the origins of this series. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me in this fine group of uh, human beings and artists. I uh, really do appreciate it. Um, so this one um, painting here. Um, you know, to tell you about it, its origins, it, it just comes from basically um, the desire to tell, to tell stories that have not been told before. Um, you know, growing up, I've never um, had the pleasures of seeing um, stories like what I paint in museums or, or schools or textbooks or anything for that matter. So, so I, I thought that it was, uh, a, you know, imperative as a uh, painter to try to to try to art, articulate, um, you know, some of the some of the feelings that I've had towards that. So, as you can see, um, this image of uh, Nat Turner um, is painted on a uh, flag, an old Betsy Ross flag, and pretty much most of the paintings that I that I do, um, I I, I um, actually acquire the one hundred percent cotton. Uh, flags usually from the south um, a, a, as a as a as a um, as a surface if you will to uh, paint um, paint these individuals that I conjure from our from our American history to um, to like put a face um, on people that were that were faceless and nameless according to our history et voila so what do you see as the relationship then between your paintings and your activism? Um, titles, activism. Am I an activist? Hmm. Am I an activist? You, the one that taught, in, your, uh, in your bio mentions art, art uh, as being an activist. Um, well, yeah. I th activism. No, I'm just, I'm just, okay, yeah. Well, I, I think I have to look up that word again. Um, because I, 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 I like to be very, very accurate with descriptions and words. Um, but what I'm doing is just basically, I'm just, I'm just, um, um, I'm just trying to paint things that I feel um, that, 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 um, that human beings should, should, be, should see. And if you want to call that activism, that's fine. But uh, I don't usually, you know, what is this? I, I it's usually like, now there's not a title to it. There is just like a need for it to be seen. I think the reason why I'm a little bit um, itchy about titles is because they seem fatty to me, and you know they seem like they can come and go. And I think that the contributions to um, to what I'm portraying specifically is too important to to fall under such. Um, a title. It should just be there, like a rock or the moon. <laughs> it's just there. So, how does how does the the stylistic approach the the because it's obviously in this series and the Buffalo Warrior yeah um, that we'll move on to later. Um, both of them have obviously got um, uh, a strong visual connection into this 
this idea of the superhero in some ways through the comic books, etc. So do you think there's a link, um, in, and, and if so, in what ways between that way of visualizing? When you say visualizing, are you saying my technique of bringing it about? Well, no, because the style, the 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 uh, the style in which they're painted, you can see on on the uh, Nat Turner on the arm, for instance, it's yeah. it's, a, it's very much based in a, a history of how comic book characters have been built visually, like how they've been drawn, mm -hmm. and I think that there's a link between that and uh, historically looking at um, that there are. Uh, that these characters in the comic books, the way that they're being drawn is as much about how they are expected to uh, stand up for certain values in the world, to, to be yeah. ethical characters in the world. Well, what you're saying sounds very, very good, but I, 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 it's not that at all. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that Come sounds on. very good, <laughs> but I have to be honest. Um, these lines that you see came about on my uh, uh, recent, uh, I mean, in my uh, continuous visits to Japan. Um, I, was, I was first invited to Japan by, um, by um, Miles Davis's um, uh, ba band members after he passed away. And uh, it, it, it was Kenny Garrett and uh, Kenny Kirkland and uh, Jeff Tane Watts and Nat, Nat, Nat Reeves on bass. And I, I, I was put in a position in a Montesando, Japan, in, in, in Tokyo, where I was on stage painting. I don't know how in the hell I got myself into that. That's, that's pretty crazy. But I found myself on a stage with the only Japanese equipment, like ink and their brushes. And I pulled out this painting uh, uh, on, 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 in a spiritual way because I didn't know what the hell I was doing up there in the first place. But but when they started playing, I just had to grab onto those guys, and it was such a spiritual awakening. And it was just one of those things that happened to uh, Jackson Pollock, where he spilled the paint, and then it became his thing. Well, these lines that you see, these quick lines, came about because I was nervous as hell on the stage, and I brought about this painting in the spiritual way, holding on to these amazing musicians' coattails. And so I just kept on pushing it. I took a couple of Sumi ink classes and calligraphy classes while in Japan. And then I came back and, I, and I, underneath every single painting that I create, you will see these reedy lines, this calligraphy, if you will. So um, how does your interest in the martial arts and Japanese culture in general then influence not only your artwork as you just described, but your thinking about maybe what art is there for, what its role can be in, in life, in ethical life? Well, I love that question. That's a, that's a delicious question. Um, and, I, and, I, and, and I will say that, um, that, that, uh, the, that my, that my uh, desire to do martial arts came in such a magical way. And you know, as human beings, you know, there's not, not a lot of human beings who pays who pay much attention to the magic that we're, that we're offered from the universe. And this happened to me very, very early on. I was a very weird little boy to be able to, uh, to like, um, to what, uh, to uh, accept that, first to recognize it, but then to accept it. Not to be long-winded, but um, the Japanese way of Bushido, came to me by way of a uh, Japanese gymnast in 1976. I knew nothing about that, but I watched uh, gymnast Shun Fujimoto dismount on his broken knee off rings and the Japanese won the, uh, the gold medal from the Russians. And I was only uh, 11 or 12. Uh, and, um, but I needed to get, I recognized that and I needed to get some of that. Didn't know what it was. But my brother came back from Okinawa training, and he did the, he was doing martial arts over the, in Japan. And ironically, they were Japanese. They were doing the same crazy shit they just were doing. <laughs> it was like, and this is called Bushido. This is called, this is, this is the way of the samurai. And I was introduced to that very early. And so I embraced that not even knowing, because I had Korean friends. And I had a lot of Chinese friends, along with my, you know, everybody else. But look at the, look at that. I, I, I was, I did, I was not taken into their culture like I was in this Japanese culture, not even knowing. 
So that's already a form of magic, you see. And so I just went on with that. And the older I got, not even paying attention, but by just the sheer thing of how the universe works when you open up, it has invited me um, to, to the country. It has invited me to the way of art. It has invited me to the way of the warrior. And it is the way that I am. Is there, does that, do you think there's a relationship between then, I mean, there's the, the subjects that you choose to paint, which have an, an aspect of that ethical thinking, presenting something that should be seen. Oh, yes. And there's a way of moving in the world, which yes. is uh, ethically moving in the world. If you're a martial artist, that's part of, uh, of the expectation of learning martial arts is that you will move differently in the world. Yes. Um, what I mean, in terms of your relationship to the art world, because you've been with some galleries and you know, had that, those kind of experiences, what is the relationship, do you think, between you as that person ethically moving and the art world here in Los Angeles? Well, the, the, the fact of the matter is, um, that's also a, a, a great question. I hope that I can answer it. Um, what the martial arts have taught me, I, by, the, by, by the way, I was also a gymnast, so that way of thinking too was also individual and it was very highly concentrated. And so with, with, with this and the way that it works with the art world is that, um, wow, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't expect anything whatsoever from the art world. And I'm just moving in the way where I'm trying to tell my story as a human being. And it happens in the way whatever I put my hands on. Is it clay if I'm sculpting? Is it paint? Is it ink? Is it canvas? Is it a flag. I'm just expressing myself as a human being. And by, and coincidentally, being African American, um, I, our, our history was just not told. And, and, and as a superhero, as a little boy growing up, there was never a superhero that looked like me, but I got, I can guarantee you, man, I was Spider Man and I was Superman. Nobody could tell me anything different. <laughs> <laughs> I get mad and I'll shoot you with an invisible like web, man. And, 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 you know, as you get older, you realize, wow, you're not, you're not, those people don't look like me. So I had um, just by what the person that, what martial arts have offered me in the art world is a way to confidently express myself without even giving a care about what, what people think to judge it, to critique it, to show it in a gallery. I just told myself if I come, if I listen to my heart and move my brushes with purpose, human beings will hear it. Human beings will see it because I'm human and I'm expressing my true self with zero bullshit. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, you know, you mentioned that my little brother was absolutely convinced that he was Mr. T <laughs> for a couple of years, completely convinced. That's magic too. You can, you, you know, I never said that I want to be a painter. I, I declared that I am a painter in New York City in 1986. Uh, and, 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 and that's another form of the magic that, that, that we have as human beings. You have to embrace. It's a leap of faith. You know? It's a leap of faith, but what is not? You open your door, it's a leap of faith if you take your ass out on the street, sure. especially where I'm from. Sure. You know? I mean, leap of faith is everywhere. And if you don't have a chance, if you don't chance anything, you won't, you won't discover anything. Um, there's great success on the other side of fear. Well, one of those things about the comic books and the martial arts is both of them essentially talk about um, how, how to gain mastery over fear. I mean, uh, through the comic books, it was always one of how to triumph against those fears physical and, and against foes, but in martial arts, it was always, don't, how, how, the first thing you have to learn is how not to be afraid to get hit. That's exactly, you know? that's absolutely right. That's absolutely correct. And it's um, not- Let me move on to this, uh, this next thing, because I mentioned earlier, uh, but it is a stage one needs to do, is conquer fear mm -hmm. to some degree. And it's the same with the art world. You, you, need to, you need to be able to move into the art world uh, and do your thing with as little fear as yeah. possible, I think. Let me ask you about your Buffalo okay. Warrior, though. Um, you, you invented this comic book character, which you're now making into an animated movie, uh -huh. um, and it's set during um, a kind of uh, Civil War period. Yeah. Um, 
tell me how, how what's the relationship do you see between you as an individual and the character well the character is me is my alpha self if, what do you call it my avatar it is absolutely my avatar because um because uh well first of all um i'm not making the movie it, it's it's going to be a studio and it's a real movie it's not animated it's it's oh it's really real i didn't realize yeah. it's a full-on there's they're like legendary and Lionsgate, they're all looking at it right now. But the but we really we finally got a, a script writer. So uh, that's a very good script script writer. So anyway, um, you know, to 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 get to your question, um, the 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 superhero character I want to bring to humanity to human beings of all walks. You see, growing up in Niagara Falls, my best friend Jack Miljor and Amber, they were they were white, and I never knew the difference. And they never, I never heard black, white, Asian. I never heard that growing up until I was like 11 and moved to Philadelphia. And then I saw a very big difference on how the government was shutting us down as black people. So, but fortunately growing up, I had the, 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 the extreme blessing of not being cursed with judging people by their outer exterior self. And so therefore, Buffalo Warriors' best friend is Renfield, and he's the kid that is the ch he's a child of the landowner, and they're like brothers. So I brought that aspect into the comic book um, because um, that uh, you know one of his his superhero powers is the fact that that it comes from um, Potolo, uh, which is a star constellation uh, that the Dogon and Mali uh, celebrate. And so uh, here in America, they teach that we are um, slaves. And in fact, that is so absolutely asinine. We, we come from a history in Africa and Buffalo Warrior will teach the movie viewers this fact, along with other, other very good goodies. And coincidentally, it's a graphic, it comes from a graphic novel. I didn't grow up with comic books and my son just asked me to create this. And it just turned into a graphic novel because I just wanted to do it. Cool. Okay, so um, it's uh, our time is now up. Um, if you guys want to see any more of Chaz's work, you can see it on uh, chazguest.com. Uh, there's more there. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk more about uh, what's going on with this uh, graphic, the, the graphic novel and uh, the movie at some other uh, point in the future. I uh, see so you've already got your sunglasses on for the movie premiere. Very good. Um, anyway, so um, we're going to move on now to uh, Sean, and he'll be talking with Kimberly. Hi, Kim. Uh, thank Hi, you. Kim. Hmm. Thanks for the introduction, Max. Um, you know, I was gonna I was gonna read your uh, your your bio. I'll just read a little bit, and then uh, maybe you can tell me a little more from your because I, I I love everyone else's personal description. So, uh, Kimberly Morris was born in West LA and uh, grew up in Lemur Park, California. Her rich Creole heritage has been a major influence on her work. Her great aunt was Floristine Perot Collins, a Creole photographer based in New Orleans. Collins was one of 101 African-American uh, women who identified themselves as photographers in the 1920 U.S. Census. Kimberly critiques self-identity, <clears throat> ideas of beauty, popular culture, and race in America via video, sculpture, photography, and painting. So, Kim, I wanted to, um, I, it's, 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 uh, we, we, t we talked a little bit about uh, your work initially when we, when we got on this phone conversation. And by the way, Kim, Kim and I, we had never met before, but I, I, uh, I was a big fan of Kim's work. Um, through a show that Arazu, uh, fellow Jordan and Ray member, curated. Uh, it was through, it was at Monta Vista Projects, right? MVP, it was last year? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no. Um, she curated a show at a gallery at Marlboro. Arazu. Right, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Um, but I just love that piece, the, uh, the piece that you had sort of dangling from the ceiling and just cascading down. I wish I had a photo of it, but I was I was just so drawn to the like really the tactile quality of it and 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 uh, there there was just there was this like very sort of um, uh, I don't know like 
ephemeral quality to it and and just it just spoke volumes just in terms of the way you uh you you integrated um this 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 uh this thing that you that that you know we're also very familiar with the hair and you did it in such a way where you're where you're actually weaving uh parts throughout and and creating something very sculptural um I was wondering if uh, maybe you could talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, the importance of hair and how, how it relates to your work. Um, so for me, as um, I'm, you know, I identify um, as Creole, which is a subculture of Black American culture. Um, so first and foremost, I want everyone to know that I identify as Black first, um, because that's a conversation that's important to have centered around Creoleness. Um, in American culture, especially in Black culture, oftentimes um, people think that Creoles don't think that they're Black or don't want to identify as Black. Um, but we are Black. Um, we're just mixed race Blacks um, that came out of Louisiana, um, specifically New Orleans is where my family is from, um, through various uh, ways of rape and incest and all kinds of other things that occurred, you know, during slavery as how my people came to be. Um, so hair for a Black woman, in particular in American culture, to me is very important. Um, to me, when I think about my hair, it's a space of trauma for me, and it shouldn't be. Um, for me to feel like I have to tame my identity to navigate life, um, is something that I think is disgusting. So sorry, I get a little emotional when I talk about it, um, but that's kind of the space that I work from. So when I make these masks, I'm, I'm often reflecting the identities that I feel like I have to masquerade when I go out into the public world. Um, but I feel as though my masks are a way for me to take that power back. Um, so that's kind of the space that I work from when I deal with um, with hair and also the idea that Black culture is not monolithic. Um, it's something that I think Black society perpetuates and something that white American society pe pe perpetuates is that we come from this monolithic culture um, that Black Americans are not allowed to identify with their, um, their other ethnicities like being Creole, you know, I have African heritage, I have French heritage. I have Italian heritage, I have German heritage, the list goes on. I have native heritage or that black Americans that are from the Caribbean can identify with their Spanish heritage that we all have to just identify solely as black or that the idea that all black people in America are African Americans when really we're from the diaspora. We Just because we're black in America doesn't mean that we all identify um, as African American, you know? so. Um, that's the space that I work through. Right, and you, you, you mentioned uh, in our phone conversation earlier that, that um, uh, you, um, you went through a really intensive uh, program through uh, cosmetology, and you, yes. uh, you like really learned how to identify with like the, you, 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 you like where, where you took your own artistic practice and made it into uh, something where you learn more about the kind of materiality of it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I felt very blessed that I was um, awarded a residency at Cerritos College through their art and tech program. So I was paired with the cosmetology department. Um, and I had two student aides that were able to teach me the, the scientific techniques behind bleaching, dyeing, what those chemical processes do, which um, in terms of like, the process of my work or thinking about, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Thinking about the content of my work is really important um, because for a very long time, processing was something that black women did to their hair to basically pass in public or um, to be accepted. Um, so to get to see firsthand experience like what those processes actually do to hair follicles um, was I think invaluable to my work. Right, right, yeah, and you, 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 uh, you, you, um, you, you do this like amazing, um, uh, like I, I, I keep referencing because um, my wife, she's, she's a, uh, um, a fiber artist, and I, I keep going back to like the, the materiality and the, and the, 
the, the way the, the, the hair sort of like works together in unison with one another. Um, I'm wondering like if you could talk a little bit more about like the how um, obviously the, the, the work is very much about uh, I want to kind of go back to like the the uh, your Creole heritage and and because it's obviously very important you know with regard to the masks can you tell me a little bit more about like how um, that sort of intersectionality has has worked with uh, as you know, with, with the masks and the, the work that you're pr currently pursuing? Yeah, so growing up Creole, you have masks in your house everywhere. Um, it's something that just becomes a part of like your everyday life. There are these artistic pieces that are around that I think sometimes, I don't know, maybe I took for granted when I was growing up. Um, but I think about like, well, what does that mean to me? Like, what does that mean that I grow up feeling A, that I have to masquerade myself um, just for survival purposes to basically survive white supremacy. But then also, what does that mean like as a culture where this is something that's a part of a religious ritual practice? Um, and so I kind of combine the two. So um, Mardi Gras, um, the masks are associated with Mardi Gras, right? So Mardi Gras is the last day before Lent starts, the day that um, basically, um, anything goes, anybody can do what they want to do. So you put these masks on to conceal your identity. So, well, what happens if I take um, these masks and use them to maybe expose my identity? Or what if I take these masks and I use hair, something that um, Black people tame or were told to tame, and I put that hair on those masks? Or for me as a Black woman, I feel like oftentimes my hair speaks for me before I ever get to open my mouth. Um, I enter a space and assumptions are made at, uh, about me based on how I've worn my hair that day or worn my hair that day. Um, so I think about those things when I'm making the work. Right, yeah, I, 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 it's, there's, there, you're, I, I love the connection between, um, you know the, the 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 carnival and and Mardi Gras and and the masks and there's it, you know it's very obviously apparent and I think I think one of the things that uh, where Kim and I kind of uh, intersect you know is both the idea of using um, you know uh, the body and and uh, body parts that things that you kind of slough off and doing it in, in sort of a way that is seemingly magical or ritualistic. And um, I, I, I posited this question for you uh, earlier. It is, is, would you say that your work is, in particular, is mystical, shamanistic? Um, do, you, do you find that there's like a religious like through line with it? Um, I would say yes. Well, first of all, coming culturally from a place like New Orleans where you, you, there's a lore built around like what it is to be Creole like we've heard about Marie Laveau and the voodoo priestesses so like that's always there but for me when I work I feel like making work is a spiritual experience for me um I feel um I know somebody uh I think it was Shiva that said earlier that she was told you know not to say that she works intuitively but there's a part of art making that no matter how much we try to pretend like it's not, there is an intuitive part of the process. And I feel like that is where um, the magic or the spiritual portion happens for me. So yeah, I may have a general idea of what I'm setting out to do, but what comes out to me is the shamanistic or the mystical portion of it. Because I don't know, for me, sometimes I feel like I'm summoning my ancestors when I'm making these things. Um, so I would say, yeah. Right, and th this is this is this is definitely where you and I meet big time because a lot of my work is about uh, summoning ancestors and assuming these like very shamanistic states. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit. Do you when you when you wear these masks and you have them photographed, is there is there a particular state of mind that you uh, you put yourself in? Is there like an identity that you assume? Um. Yeah, so I feel like each mask each mask has a personality. Um, what that personality is, I don't know until I put it on. Um, so I don't know if you've noticed in uh, the two that you showed earlier. Um, there's also yeah, so Passe Blanc and I think it's Faith. 
they have clothing to match each one. So I feel like I am becoming like a god or a goddess when I put these on. Like, and what what personality or what ego or a uh, persona would uh, this particular deity that I've created have? Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because I, I can. I can definitely. Um, uh, like with with my work, um, I'm just kind of tying tying them back together. The it's this idea of of like bringing the mask and 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 the, you know conjuring these ancestral bodies to to kind of make sort of this more um, kind of ritualistic altar. You know that that kind of that the pieces kind of form together. Um, do you? I, I've noticed that like fragments of your body have reappeared throughout your work, uh, and you you also make casts of your face, um, use clippings of your own hair, photograph yourself in situ. Um, practical considerations aside, do you are there are there um, are there benefits to putting yourself in the uh, uh, as as the sitter as opposed to hiring somebody out or using a, a model or an anonymous donor? Um. Yes and no. Um, there are times where I use other people, but it is very rare. One, I'm super accessible to myself for starters. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so that kind of makes it easy. But I think one of the reasons that I tend to use myself more than others is because of a lot of the trauma is about myself or the traumas that I feel as though I've experienced, even though the traumas that I've experienced centered around my hair or my blackness can be universal. Um, I feel as though the, the way to be most genuine is to tell them through my own experience. Um, I find that people can relate to you more when you're telling your own story versus trying to tell someone else's story. Um, there's less assumptions that are made. I can answer questions more accurately. Um, so that's one of the reasons I feel as though it's important to use myself, especially depending on what the specific thing is about. Because sometimes, um, even though I'm sitting there, it's not really a self-portrait. So for instance, Faith, that's not my hair. It's hair that was given to me by a salon. Um, I've just cre I've created a persona and a character. Same thing with Passe Blanc, but there's other works where my own hair is integrated into the mask. So it's very specifically about me, my experience um, of navigating the world. Right. Cool. Well, we, uh, we're, we're almost out of time, but we have one more. Uh, we have a question. Are there uh, performative actions apart from the photographs? From Max? Burke? No. There haven't been so far, but I feel like that is the next natural space for me to be in. Um, it's something that I have, I want to say kind of avoided, um, just probably out of my own fear about performing. Um, but I feel like I'm in a space where that definitely needs to happen because I'm creating all these, these, this lore and this identity and this costuming. And it's unfortunate that the only place right now people are able to see that is through photographs. So I think that's definitely the next phase for me. Well, as speaking from experience, somebody who uh, uh, is terrified to death of being <laughs> on stage um, and somebody who also integrated performance in, in my own work, I actually did this last year in Rome and I, I highly recommend it. I feel like you're, you, it would, this is probably a really gr good next step, obviously when things open up a little bit so right yeah <laughs> my fiance always tells me fear is false energy appearing real so <laughs> so that's kind of the, the i know it's the next stop <laughs> excellent were there any other questions for uh, for kimberly all right all right gotta unmute max Maybe. okay so there we go. Um, I, I, thank you, Kimberly. Um, I'm, you, Kim. I guess this is the end of our, uh, our session together. Um, I want, want to thank uh, all the speakers. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, most appreciated. Uh, thank you for Durden and Ray, uh, the artists, for selecting you um, and giving us such an interesting choice of people to listen to. Um, remember that uh, this is a thing that's going to be happening every two weeks. Uh, there will be another group of four 
in two weeks time um, and there'll be uh, who knows who they'll be I have no idea um, but I'm sure that will be an interesting um, uh, talk as well um, don't forget you can check out our website to do the, the walkthrough to see all these artworks by the artists that we're talking tonight um, and you can check on uh, uh, Facebook for updates about who the next artists are that come along with group two um, I'm sure that uh, uh, this will be an ongoing, I mean, it's going to be an ongoing series for a couple of months now because of the numbers of Durden and Ray. Um, so we'll be doing this for a few months and then we'll see how else we can, uh, as a group, um, be supportive of artists that are out there in Los Angeles doing their thing. So uh, thank you so much, everyone. You stay safe, uh, hopefully sane. Um, drink too much, of course, uh, uh, because it seems to be uh, an answer. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Wonderful. Thank you, Max. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thank you.